Again, our topic this morning is Blueprint PCB. We're going to take a look at Blueprint PCB. Uh, first of all, the concepts behind Blueprint, and then we'll take a look at demonstration of the tool, including the new features and functionality in version 6 of Blueprint. Blueprint started out as a uh, PowerPoint, uh, not unlike this presentation here. Uh, in working with our existing customers, one of the biggest complaints was the lack of documentation tools in their CAD systems. So we came up with some concepts, and those were, of course, run by our customers that evolved into the tool that Blueprint is today. We started with the idea that documentation is pretty finite. Uh, we're all doing very similar types of documentation. Uh, fab drawings, assembly drawings, parts lists, panel drawings. Uh, the content is pretty similar. Drill patterns, top bottom side views, layer stack ups. And much of the information needed to create this common content was created when we created the design. So if we can leverage off of that design file, we can automate the creation of the documentation. And there are several concepts that go along with that. Uh, the first is we wanted to use more of an office type approach to creating this document set. Uh, instead of a CAD-like approach. Uh, the reason being that's what you're used to creating documents with is things like PowerPoint and Excel and Visio. We want it to be drag and drop. What you see is what you get, not uh, conceal and hide layers to the point where we get something that we can print to a PDF and then the first time we see the actual document is when we do create that PDF. And as I said before, we want to use the PCB design to create this documentation. So we use the intelligence of the PCB design to create things like drill charts, parts lists, layer stack ups, exploded views, top and bottom side views. We wanted to allow unlimited placement of the PCB views mirror them, scale them, rotate them, do magnify views, do exploded views, all independent of each other. Uh, with the current implementations, often you're limited to the number of different views that you can do. So this gives the user much more flexibility in creating their documentation. We've organized the user interface specifically for what we're trying to do, which is PCB documentation. There are palettes that reflect the different type of documents, or if you're just creating a generic document, or if you're just doing dimensioning, the palettes are there for you and help you arrange the uh, elements that you may want to use on your drawing. We took that one step further with the ribbon interface. When you're working on a particular type of element, whether that be a PCB view, a parts list, a, a drill chart, or a note block, when you are working on that type of document, the proper ribbon shows up, the context sensitive ribbon shows up to help you work on that particular type of element. We wanted to give you the ability to import uh, different types of data other than just the CAD database, whether that be uh, graphic files, uh, maybe a step file, a reference file, a PDF, DXF, Gerber, or really any kind of graphics or text from other applications. We wanted to help you by using some wizards or templates to create some of the common content. So we start with a graphic image, we import the CAD database, and it creates our layer stack up, expands to the proper layer count, adds the dielectrics, copper thicknesses, all that information is in the CAD database. Then we wanted to provide a set of tools for everything else. 
basically everywhere you look at text in this tool it's a word processor with everything that goes along with that font control paragraph control justification superscript subscript all caps strikeout all the things that go along with word processing including spell check and spell check that is localized to the uh, uh, the language being used we have a set of drafting tools, so everything from a uh, uh, circle tool to a rectangle tool to lines and polylines can be added. So you can do your drawing of details inside of this tool rather than doing it in a mechanical tool and importing it. A full set of dimensioning tools, everything from point to point dimensioning to GDNT type dimensioning. Uh, the ability to use tables and import data directly into those tables, copy and paste between other Windows apps, uh, exotic file importation, what I mean by that is OLE, being able to bring in and embed a file in its native format inside of your Blueprint document, and then if you need to edit it, you can simply open it up inside of Blueprint, and any changes are immediately reflected. Since we're using the CAD database to create the documentation, it only makes sense that if the database changes, what you need to do to update the documentation is just import the new database. So in this case, we had a four layer board with some through hole components. It got updated to a six layer with some surface mounts. And all we had to do to update our documents was just import the new data. And then we want to create electronic documentation. We want to get away from paper documentation. So uh, while we fully support that with the creation of PDF, some people would call PDF electronic documentation, we have options that will allow you to take that further, which include our own database viewer, which you're seeing an example of here. You get a detail, you click on it, up pops the detail and inside the detail are several items in there that if you click on them it takes you directly to the parts list. So we can hyperlink throughout our tool and if you use our database viewer then all those hyperlinks are active and uh, the user can si simply click on them on the other side to go to a particular item. We wanted to provide multiple viewing alternatives, so I've mentioned a couple times that we have our own uh, database viewer. Anybody can download that from our website. We also have the ability to pack and release, where you take the document set, package it up with the viewer, and just send a single file out to your vendor. We have an HTML version of the document set, plus of course we can do hard copy, PDF, and DXF outputs. So in conclusion of the PowerPoint, really the only change we've seen in this area in the last 15-20 years is PDF. And with this release of Blueprint, not only do we embrace PDF as an option, but we allow 3D PDF to be output. And of course, we get, again have our own database viewer, which has more intelligence built into it that anybody can use. What we're trying to do here is shorten the document cycle, improve manufacturing instructions, and get on to the next project sooner. So this is Blueprint 6.0. Uh, if you're familiar with older versions of Blueprint, you'll notice the colors changing in the, uh, the interface here. We've tried to go to a, uh, a lighter color scheme just to make it easier for those of you that uh, um, you know are, are in this tool and other tools all the time just to kind of ease the eye strain. There's some other enhancements to version 6 that we'll see as we, uh, as we go through this demonstration. We've split off the dimensioning uh, tools from the common elements palette if you're again an existing user. Just to try to clean up this area a little bit. The application itself is 64-bit now, so uh, no longer 32-bit apps for our downstream tools. They're all 64-bit. 
So what I'm going to do here is start with this template set. This is my uh, standard document set that I use for each job that I do. Uh, a couple page fab drawing and, and at least three pages of the assembly drawing. And I'm going to start just like I would when I'm ready to start documenting my design by importing the actual design. From most of the CAD tools out there will bring either ODB++ or IPC2581. We still support PADS ASCII as well. Now you might wonder why each CAD system has the ODB split out. Each CAD system outputs ODB a little bit differently. So in order to make sure that we pull in as much information as possible, we've had to split these out so that it's looking for a particular CAD system. Not necessary if you're using IPC 2581, of course. So let's go ahead and bring in some information. We'll do the IPC 2581 in this case. And all of my drawings are going to update based on that incoming information. Now, as we're looking at all the drawings from a, a top level view here, you'll notice some things right away. I've done a two to one of my PCB views. I just set that up by default. Uh, my assembly panel, though, I went ahead and did one to one. And again, these are just personal preferences, but uh, you can set all this type of stuff up in advance. The other thing from this level to notice is the title blocks. Of course, they automatically update based on this uh, incoming data. The sheet numbering updates automatically depending on how many sheets we're using. The drawing number is a, uh, a document variable. So there are many document variables built into Blueprint and you can add your own. And the reason this makes sense, of course, is that you don't want to be typing in a part number on every drawing. You enter it one place and it goes out and populates your drawings. So the uses for document variables, the revision, the sheet size, the scaling, the sheet numbering are all document variables. So let's go to the first drawing of our uh, document set here. Let's take a look at it and then we'll go through some of the, uh, the features on each one of these as we, uh, as we go through them. So this is our fabrication drawing. As I said before, this is a two-to-one representation of our design. Uh, when we dimension this, it'll be reflective of the actual dimensions, so it doesn't matter if it's a two-to-one or one-to-one. -one. And you can always rearrange items once you've imported your data if you need to, or I could scale this back to one-to-one -to -one if I needed to. I'm going to start by adding some dimensions here. I'm going to add a datum dimension and then I'm just going to simply start adding dimensions off of that datum dimension. Now in this case I didn't have them auto arrange, but you can always have it auto arrange your dimensions as you're placing them, or you can move them later on. We also have push and shove if you need to use those sorts of things uh, to move around your dimensions or to uh, to make them fit on your screen. We also have point to point dimensioning, where you can snap to a feature, grab another feature, and place that dimension. Now all these dimensions here I'm using English units. You probably notice one thing right away. This one's in orange for some reason. I bet you can figure out why it's not snapped to anything. So we identify that for you. So it helps you make sure that you are snapping to items as you place dimensions. If we grab one of these dimensions and go to the format options, you can see that we have many, many choices as far as what the dimensions look like how they're placed, what type of dimension, do we want to add tolerancing, what does that tolerancing look like, do we want to add additional text either before or after the dimension, do we want to override the dimension, do we want to show the units, press zeros, what font do we want to use, what do the lines look like, how close do they come to the object that we're dimensioning, 
what units are we using? Do we want to use the default units or a different set of units? Do we want to do dual dimensioning so that you know every time we place a dimension, it places both the English and metric equivalent of that dimension? So all of these items can be set up in advance and be defaulted for all your documents, or it can be done by a sheet, or it can even be done by an individual dimension. We also support GD&T. Now, not all of you are doing GD&T, but if you are, you can drop down a feature control frame, you know, snap it to something, and then start adding the GD&T symbols to it. We look at the ratio of the size of the symbol to the size of the box, which is specified by the spec, and we go ahead and size it automatically for you. Now you see my drill chart has a uh, the same symbols, of course, as my drill pattern. Uh, obviously, I can change those symbols if I want to. I have a fabrication manager where I can come off and I can format the symbols. Uh, I can make them bigger, of course, if I wanted to, or make them smaller. As I said before, I can actually change the symbol that I'm using, and of course it will be reflected in both the drill chart and the drill pattern. Uh, if my CAD system did not add any tolerancing to my uh, my holes here, I can auto tolerance. I can even split off things like buried and blind vias. So you'll notice once I do this, that my drill chart is updated immediately reflects that there's different types of 8 mil vias now. As a matter of fact, if I wanted to, I could format any drill chart or drill pattern to just show specific holes. So if I just wanted to show the 8 mil holes that are going through 1 through 3 and 4 through 6, or just a part of those, I can simply just format that. And then I can come over here to my drill pattern and do the same thing. So I can have as many drill charts and drill patterns as I want, all reflective of uh, through holes and or partial drills. My layer stack up pulled all the information from the incoming uh, data. If for some reason that data has changed, let's say for instance we've sent this off to an AE at a fab shop and they've tweaked the uh, the stack up a little bit, I can go into the stack up visualizer, which is a new feature here in this particular version, and I can change those dielectrics. So let's just say these became uh, maybe the top two layers for impedance reasons became uh, 12 mils instead of 10, and then we're going to have 10 in all these other locations. Once I've done that, I click OK, and it's going to update all of my document information with that new information. And now, even in my layer stack up here, we'll see the new information populating. Now, the stack up visualizer has other options as well. One of them is to do a, uh, a 3D view of the stack up, if you like. And that can be placed onto the drawing. The other thing is, is all the materials that are used can be saved off to a database, uh, a materials table, and you can build up a materials table for your available materials, whether that be at the fabricator you're using or um, if you are a fabricator, what materials you have available. These can be exported in a CSV format, brought into other management tools like MRP systems. Uh, you can just simply import the information once you've created your stack up here. The next thing I'd like to show you is one of our wizards. This is our layer stack up wizard. Let 
me edit the template and then I'll just edit a couple fields here so you get an idea of how it's created. So it's a combination of static uh, verbiage like layer and then the layer number comes from the incoming data. The layer type, the net name, and the layer thickness all come in and populate the fields. So then when I import data it executes and produces that information. Last thing I want to talk about here on the fabrication drawing is the note block. Now our note blocks are semi-intelligent. Each note is kind of a separate entity in that if I want to add a call out all I have to do is go to a particular note and say add call out then I can take this call out and snap it to something and now it's not only linked so that if I move this call out around it gets updated and I can demote it and promote it or even delete it and the call out goes away but it's also hyperlinked so if I click on that hyperlink this is if I'm using our blueprint viewer it'll bring up the note as opposed to having to go to search for it Another thing you'll notice is spell check is already being used here. I can right click, go to spelling, and it's going to give me some options, or I can add it to the dictionary. You'll notice I have all of my font control, all of my uh, uh, paragraph control available to me here as I'm working in a note block, and then I have options specific to the note block itself, like splitting off the note block merging two different note blocks, change the order, go from top to bottom, bottom to top, and then there's even formatting options on the note block. So uh, we can look at, you know, how far each level is indented. Do I want to start with numbering, then lettering? And when I do, you'll notice that this indent changes as well all the way through here. And I've got five levels to work with. Things like punctuating, anything that you have a, a call out, some people want to do that, so we put it in here as an option. And even the call outs themselves can be uh, formatted. Uh, different shapes, uh, have them auto size, and you can of course uh, default all of these as well so that you don't have to change it each time. Let's move on to uh, page two of our fabrication drawing. And what we've started here is an assembly panel drawing. Now it's very important to realize we're talking about assembly panels and not fabrication panels. We want to document the assembly panel. Now some of the things we were able to do in advance, in advance was to put down a uh, mill tab detail, a drill chart. We've already placed some fiducials and tooling holes onto our panel. So now it's a simple matter of formatting the panel to look like what we want it to look like, add some dimensions, add some notes, and we should be done with our assembly panel drawing creation. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it today, but just go through a few items here. Um, formatting the panel will allow us to space the boards inside the panel. If we're happy with the spacing inside here, then we can go to editing the panel. And when we edit the panel, it makes it look like an actual PCB. To this PCB, I can now add a web route. And to that web route, I can now add mill tabs. Now I have different mill tabs that ship with the product, or I can create my own. Once I've created my own, I can set it as a default. So then I can just simply drag and drop it onto a sheet. And it's only going to be placed where I can place a mill tab. So once I've placed one, I can continue to add mill tabs. Of course, I can type in dimensions for where these are going. But the other thing we have is the ability to associate mill tabs. So if I take this one, right click on it, and associate it to this one, now they will move in conjunction with each other. 
I can also turn on layers here and see if I'm overlapping copper or overlapping component outlines. I can take that one step further in that I can actually run a set of DRCs against the mill tab placement that will tell me if I'm too close to component outlines, a copper, uh, other features, and I can even place keep out and keep in areas. All of this is done through the mill tab manager where again I can create various types of mill tabs or I can set up my milling checks. Once I'm happy with the placement of my mill tabs I can just say apply to all the images and then I can just have it merge in any areas that would drop out, drop out. I click outside here and there's my panel. Again, just add some dimension, add some notes, and I should be done with my assembly panel drawing. I can even add score lines and web routes and mill tabs and have them combined intelligently so that everywhere where I've got both a score line and a web route, the software will allow us to intelligently merge those just as if it was being run on a uh, milled machine. Let's move on to the assembly drawing. Now what I've got here so far is just a, uh, a top side view where I'm showing the component outlines and the reference designators. But one thing you should be aware of, this is not copied from a silk screen or something like this. Blueprint will intelligently recreate your reference designators based on some parameters that you supply. So you can set a minimum font size, a maximum font size, and you can tell Blueprint to recreate your reference designators. And it'll go ahead and create them and center them in the component uh, bodies for you automatically. This greatly helps with reference designator cleanup. I can also go in and grab a group of reference designators if I want to and move those off and then disperse them however I want to. So whenever I'm in this reference designator edit mode I get the reference designator ribbon here and then I've got several options that are based off of uh, cleanup of reference designators. I can also do some formatting of the components themselves. If I come in here and select a particular component, I get the uh, format options. Now this can be done a couple different ways. Here I could just simply go in and say, you know what, uh, I want to fill this particular component. Let's add a pattern and let's add a color. And it'll do that for me. And you know what, I want to do it to all components of that type. And then as you can see, there are many, many options here as far as what sort of information we can display. Maybe I want to show pins, and I want to show an outline of a pin, and I want to mark pin 1, and I want to mark pin 1 in a specific color. And again, I can do that, and it's going to do it to all of the components that I've selected. But the other way of doing it is that I can come over here and select the components in this list, and then go to the uh, format component option and then whatever changes I make here will be reflective of the components selected in this list. Another thing that Blueprint can help you with is working with variants. Now variants can be imported via the CSV import option Once they're imported, any items that are uninstalled can be highlighted either with a fill or with a, uh, a color to let the users know that those particular items uh, no longer remain on the design. And then we can also drop down a variant list that's reflective of that variant. So in this case, I'm just going to go out to my PCB view and instead of showing the main build, I'm going to show build 1, which is my variant, and I'll click OK. 
And in this case, what I've done is these actual same components here are now showing as uninstalls. And I can just simply go out here and drop down a variant legend that was reflective of that. And again, I could add fills here if I wanted to and uh, other things to call attention to the items that I am going to uh, have uninstalled. As I said before, I can have a variant list that goes along with this as well. Once I place my variant list, I decide which variant that I want to use and what I want to show. Let's just show the uninstalls here. And now we have a variant list to go with our variant. When you're working with parts lists and variants lists inside of Blueprint, you will notice that we do hyperlink to a view of the particular PCB. This will help you in the QA area and this is available in our free viewer as well. Next thing I'd like to show you is process steps. This is another feature of Blueprint. We have a process step manager. Now we can start by just adding a process step, give it a color, come down and select some components, add it to that particular color. But we've also provided you with some templates that will help you uh, do this faster. And you can select how you want to separate out your parts, tell it to auto-generate your colors for you. Once it's done that, then all you need to do is drop down a PCB view and then format that PCB view to be reflective of the process steps that you want to show. And you can choose some of them or all of them to show in any particular view. And then you can drop down a, a process step chart that's reflective of these items as well. Let's move on to the uh, parts list itself that we've created. So it's a very simple parts list. I can choose which fields I want to include. This is another one of our wizards. If I edit the template, you can see that there's fields that I'm using. If I go into any of these fields, then I can choose other ones, add additional fields, all based on the parts list assembly variants, even imported data. I can import a parts list and have it supplement the parts list that's in the, uh, the database that I imported. And again, once data is loaded, the parts list goes ahead and executes. And it is hyperlinked to a 2D view of the uh, PCB. There is a parts list manager where I can work with both the variants, any data that I've imported, any data that I've added manually. I can set up electrical and mechanical associations like for every connector I might have two bolts and two nuts and two washers and have it do all of that automatically for me as I add those particular types of components. I can work with alternate parts, substituted parts, and I can work with my variants in here. Now let's take a look at one of the newer features in Blueprint and that is the 3D capability. If I click on the 3D design tab, we now get a 3D representation of the board. We'll even uh, color it for you to make it look like a real board. Now as I move around here in this 3D mode, you'll notice that I've got component height information that came from the CAD database. We are not, um, it's important to realize, we're not importing step models here. We're basically recreating the components based on their outline and the height information in the incoming database. 
I can spread layers apart, get a look at my partial vias as well as my through hole vias, turn on any of my internal layers or turn them off, peel off layers from the top, turn the components on and off, Anytime I need to go back to uh, my original view, I can hit the home button. I can use the X plane to cut into the board and spin it around and take a look at where I've cut into it. I can configure the design to show it as a wireframe, thus giving me visibility through the design. Notice that we also reverse the uh, solder mask so you can look through and see the actual surface mounts. And if we zoom in enough here and I turn off the uh, actual components, you'll see that we've even provided things like pin numbers and net names here, even in the 3D mode. And when I move the mouse over various components, it will give me the uh, info on those components tell me what their reference designator is. Now Blueprint is a, a 3D viewer but more importantly it allows us to put down 3D views of the PCB into our documentation. So if we go back over to our document set here and let's just use this page I'm going to go to my assembly drawing palette and I'm going to drop down a 3D view of my assembly. And then if I want to edit what that view looks like, I can edit that view, change it, do zooming or whatever I need to, but once I'm done with that, I can come back out here and it's going to be reflective of what changes I've made on that particular view of the PCB. Another thing I can do is add a scrollable parts list. So I've got a regular old parts list here, but if I'm doing electronic documentation and I know I'm going to be looking at this in 3D, then I can add a scrollable parts list that will be linked to this 3D view and actually cross probe from this scrollable parts list to my 3D view in the Adobe tool. Once I've exported my 3D view of my drawing, then I can simply open that up in Adobe Acrobat. And as I said before, we can cross probe to this, this view just by selecting items out of this parts list and that will be highlighted up here in the view. And the view itself can be manipulated just as we were doing and there's a full set of tools on the Adobe side for doing. So once we've completed our document set, what's left is to of course uh, export it. Now we can simply save this off as a DPD, a downstream product database. And this database can be opened up by both Blueprint and the uh, free uh, Blueprint viewer. You can also, of course, export the PDF as we've already seen, DXF, or send it directly to a printer. Here is our design package in the Blueprint Viewer. All of the hyperlinks are maintained. As well as the 3D info has come across and we can manipulate the 3D here in the Viewer as well. Well that's all I've got for this morning. Uh, hopefully I was able to introduce you to Blueprint 6.0, some of the new features in Blueprint, as well as some of the features from previous versions. Mm -hmm.